are not medical people they know law to some extent definitely and they are not experts in medicine so only when both the people meet there will be some conclusion we can arrive at but there will be lot of uh, jokes also in between i will finally tell what happened what happened to me in one of the courts i appeared in the courts so far more than 60 times and uh, except to supreme court all courts i appeared including two times human rights court also commission so and dr ashokar also went as a expert witness in cases so it's a very important practical thing very rarely it will come but even sometimes once enough some of the cases we get into the pray because if you do not do rightly our job we will be having a very tough time and we will be become a laughing stock there most of the day we will not be there so it's young practitioners and especially nowadays most of them coming out from private medical colleges those who do not have much idea or sometimes no idea at all about uh, the so many legal procedures including admission procedures handling mentally ill prisoners all these things so it's very important for youngsters especially most of the serious baby no so it's the right person and the right topic you have chosen now i request uh, i welcome my co-chair dr ashok reddy from hyderabad uh, Uh, i request now dr ashokan and dr ashok reddy will give the concluding remarks thank you professor nambi thank you very much for the kind words okay. professor ashok reddy organizers executive council members of south zone and friends at the very outset let me sincerely thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to speak your few words on the topics i care as in court as an expert witness law is a sanctioning discipline and psychiatry is a therapeutic discipline and the interface called legal psychiatry there is a possibility of emanation of conflicting views in all the mental health related issues especially with reference to criminal responsibility very recently the mental health care act 2017 had been passed and considering the conceptual issues like advanced directives nominated representatives and admission procedures and concerned issues psychiatry is going to be more legalized unless we become little familiar with the legal provisions in situations where we are expected to offer our opinion things are going to be problematic in fact i would like to approach this topic in three different components the legal provisions in which our, the situations in which we are expected to offer our opinion that's the first part second part compilation of our report or our opinion the do's and don'ts and also the manner and attitude one has to really inculcate at the time of appearing as an expert witness in the court anybody who is witnessing an event or at seen an event is becoming a witness there are four possibilities for the psychiatrist to appear in the court one as a defendant second as a lay witness third you would have treated an individual probably to know about the intricate issues with reference to the treated individual you would have been summoned by the court or as a as an expert witness considering the training and experience and the expertise the psychiatrist could have been summoned one you would have been summoned by the prosecution or by the defense or by the judge or the tribunal as an expert witness is a person who has got a experience in a specialized field or more knowledge in a particular subject or has got an experience for a lengthy period to offer opinion in intricate issues 
while facing the court, I think he has got the privilege to refer the textbooks, absolutely it is allowed. And he has to assist the court and he should not be influenced by extraneous factors and he should not pass any comment which may really have an impact on the judicial conclusions. He may be a non-testifying expert. Probably he may assist the defense of the other contesting party in arriving at certain decisions or clarifying some of the issues. But when he is appearing as a testifying expert, he has to tell the truth. Under the oath, he has to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. What are the situations where psychiatrists' opinions are expected? One with the reference to Mental Health Care Act, admission and discharge and other procedures, I am not going to dwell in depth in these issues. In the civil court, when guardianship, testamentary capacity, marriage and divorce, child custody, disability compensation, mental condition with reference to fitness of the individual. And in the criminal milieu, probably the assessment of suicide or fitness to stand trial or assessment to offer opinion to invoke insanity defense which comes into the purview of Section 84 IPC. These are all the civil laws related to psychiatry, one marriage act, the Evidence Act 1925, the laws of contract Section 6, 11, 12, Election Act 326, Indian Succession Act, Section 52. Regarding guardianship, there is no provision in the Mental Health Care Act 2017, and this is going to be really confusing. In Mental Health Act, there is a provision, Section 52, which covers guardianship. If the alleged mentally ill is incapable of taking care of himself as well as not in a position to manage his property, that comes under the purview of Section 53. But if he is able to care, take care of himself but not in a position to manage his property, then that will come under the purview of Section 54. Unfortunately, there is no provision in the Mental Health Care Act and this is one of the criticism we just discussed when we met the Prime Minister's office. Unfortunately, there is a section in the Rights of Persons with the Disabilities Act that Section 13 is concerned with the guardianship. When I say guardian, it is a legal guardian. And when there are any conflicting issues with reference to guardianship, appointment of guardianship as per Mental Health Act 1987, that has to be amended or remedied as per Section 111. You know pretty well there is already a nominated representative who is behaving, going to behave like a guardian with the treatment related issue. Another legal guardian appointed by the court, he is going to manage his financial property. Imagine a situation where the nominated representative is appointed by the board and if the court says the capacity of the individual is alright and there is no need for any legal guardian and if it is going to be incongruous, this is going to open a Pandora's box. Things are going to be complicated with reference to guardian, two guardians, one for treatment, another for managing his property. Testamentary capacity. This is the capacity to write the will. At the time of compilation of the will, the person should know the extent, nature of the property and the beneficiaries of the property. And it must be in a position to do simple arithmetic calculation, not to the extent of deciphering the Pythagoras theorem, but at least it must be in a position to say 2 plus 2, 4, not like 3. And that comes under Section 59 of Indian Succession Act 1925. There is no adoption procedure in Christian, Parsi and Muslim laws, but there are certain court-directed orders I think uh, subsequently they probably you know, adopted some children. With reference to the Hindu Adoption Maintenance Act 1956, at the time of adoption one person should have sound mind. And with the sound mind only you can give adoption to other people. Human Organs Act 2009. For the mentally ill, if he is going to be the recipient, the guardian, I mean the legal guardian has to give the informed consent. But to donate a particular organ, you know pretty well, some of the medical colleges, they were referring to Institute of Mental Health when I was an assistant professor to offer opinion and the, invariably the donor was mentally retarded. It is very difficult to prove the concept called the best interest of the mentally ill when he is probably asked to donate 
So it is not possible. In any case, I think we have to get the directions from the court. Contract is a written or a spoken agreement between two parties which comes under Section 12 of Indian Contract Act. I think it may or may not be registered. And the person with the sound mind should know the nature and consequences. These are all the divorce laws. Hindus, Hindu, Hindu Marriage Act 1955, Christians Indian Divorce Act 1869, the Indian Christian Marriage Act 1872. For Muslims, we have personal laws of divorce, dissolution of marriage act, the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce Act A 1986, and Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act 1936, and we have Special Marriage Act 1954. The concept of nullity of the marriage, that is invariably, you know, discussed. Nullity is nothing but whether the marriage is valid at the time of marriage. There are four important questions to be answered to conclude whether the marriage is null and void. One, whether there is any mental illness at the time of marriage. Second, whether the person has got an adequate comprehension to give consent. Third, whether it has got a capacity for procreation. And fourth, certain relationships are prohibited by certain religious codes, probably incestuous marriages are not permitted. To claim divorce, the petitioner has to prove that there is a history of mental illness with the florid symptoms, and it should be severe and dangerous, continuous, in spite of treatment, there is no relief, it is incurable. I think in the morning, I think Thomas John was saying about the certificates. Many people with a normal IQ are just below normal. They get this learning disability certificate. But unfortunately, that is a valid ground for divorce. I think low IQ and learning disorder with no legal and social obligations, that's a valid ground for divorce. Unfortunately, maybe in the academic area, they may shine with the assisted probably help, but in the marital area things are going to be problematic if another party is going to raise it as an issue. Previously epilepsy was included as a valid ground for divorce, but now that is subsequently omitted as per Act 39 of 199 Section 2, but subsequent now epilepsy with psychosis, that's a valid ground for divorce, but unfortunately I think we are not able to really differentiate epilepsy with the behavioral problem. The behavioral problem is just imitating that of a psychosis and psychosis how to define psychosis with reference to probably you know epilepsy there is an alteration in the stream of consciousness and the person is fainting and the person is exhibiting bizarre movements absolutely after that i think the person is said to be in a confused state when these things are proved in the right way i think it can be contested and this is another gray area to be discussed in the legal as well as psychiatric forum under the Muslim law, the person with the sound mind is eligible to marry, but if the guardian thinks that the marriage of the mentally ill is in the best interest of the patient and if he is willing to accept the financial obligations, yes, that can be proceeded. Before uttering talaq, that should be really you know, uh, preceded by attempts of reconciliation by two arbiters. And this is coming under the purview of the Dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act. And Christian law as well as Parsi law, there should be unsound of the mind. It should be incurable and that should be continuously present for two years till the time of the petition. And Indian Divorce Act that comes under Section 10 of unsoundness of mind must be incurable and should be continuous for more than two years. This is Special Marriage Act against similar uh, observations and also I think important should be there at the time of the marriage. These are all the laws with reference to importance. This is another grey area. Section 19 of Class 1 of the Indian Divorce Act, Section 30 of the Parsi Marriage Act, Section 24 of the Special Marriage Act, 12 of Hindu Marriage Act, they all we are concerned with the importance. But unfortunately, the psychiatrist should be in a position to differentiate whether it is an organic importance or psychological importance. Unfortunately, we are doing a lot of tests. Probably you know, we are asking many questions whether there is any relationship with the per precipitation or the perpetuation by the psychological factor. Or whether it is primary or secondary. Or it is curable or incurable. 
if it is related to any drug or physical problem if after the marriage then it is not a ground for divorce at the time of marriage if it is present organic impotence then that is a valid ground for the divorce some people may have impotence with the legal wife but not with the third person i think you cannot really contest the case because the issue is between the legal wife and the husband not with the not between the husband and the servant maid so i think it is a valid ground for divorce birth of a child is not a conclusive evidence for consummation because there is a possibility of fecundation of ab extra and consummation is also another important concept consummation means penetration legally speaking importance for a male i think he has to produce an erection he has to maintain an erection for penetration after penetration he must maintain the erection till the production of orgasm in spite of achieving all these things in spite of making the female to go for orgasmic level if the female says kuch nahi i am not satisfied then legally it should be considered as importance the quality of satisfaction who is going to measure there is no scale and the magistrate is not at all aware of it in fact female sexuality the subjective arousal is perceived by the female only up to certain point beyond that it is being modulated by central dopaminergic mesolimbic system and unfortunately she is not aware of it so it's little difficult complicating conceptual uh, factors are there with reference to female sexuality if the female contests for importance she is going to win the case and so i think we should really you know formulate our questions in such a way to different shape but things are going to be little problematic if organic importance present plus psychological factors acting on it many many tests are available penile doppler to know about the arterial arterial as well as venous insufficiency nocturnal penile tumorsense test dynamic cavernous i mean uh, infusion cavernosography of all the test this particular test intracavernosal injection of vasoactive drug equivalent the most sensitive test to differentiate organic as well as psychological importance you can administer either one drug papaverine or prostaglandin or pentolamide bimix three drugs and see whether the person is achieving erection inquire whether the person is achieving erection during sexual activity inquire whether the person is achieving erection in the early morning if all these areas if the person is experiencing erection i think this is an important uh, tabular column to know about uh, the differences between to conclude whether it is an organic or psychological importance in all the areas i think is achieving erection but absolutely i think because of the uh, latent anxiety is not able to rise up to the occasion in the libidinal area maybe it's again psychological with little bit sex education and assurance the person can be helped in all the areas is not getting erection it's going to be vasculogenic after equivalent is getting erection but not during sexual activity not during early morning then it is going to be neurogenic if there is an equivocal response i think we have to repeat the test much water has flown in this area call criminal responsibility and no court in the subcontinent had gone, gone beyond the level of intellectual comprehension test of knowing right from the wrong test of differentiating right from the wrong unfortunately still the court they follow a primitive concept called i think mcnaughton's rule and indian subcontinent courts i think they have not even going for partial insanity the concept of partial responsibility and this is an illustration what exactly will happen to a mentally ill if he is committing an offence imagine a mentally ill committing an offence if fire is placed after inquiry the case is charge sheeted when the case is charge sheeted that means the case is ready for the trial and at that point of time the magistrate uh, probably the psychiatrist is expected to give an opinion for fitness to stand trial and imagine is appearing in the trial process and at that time is the psychiatrist is going to offer his opinion to invoke section 84 ipc insanity defense if it is accepted the case is acquitted if he is not fit to stand trial i think based on 330 class 2 crpc is referred to psychiatric hospital as an under trial prisoner 
if insanity defense is invoked, accepted, he is going to, going to be treated as an acuted individual and with 335 class 2 CRPC as an acuted individual is going to land up in the psychiatric hospital after a period of normalcy for three years, I think the person has to be changed as a civil case. So in two occasions, one before the trial, the psychiatrist is expected to give opinion and during the trial, there may be a chance to appear in the court of law. What are the things to consider in assessment of fitness to start trial? See whether the person is oriented to a time, place, or person. See whether the person is having intact memory. See whether the person is able to comprehend and answer questions and must be in a position to guide the trial process. See whether the person is aware of a particular act he had committed which is now controlled as an offence. See whether the person is aware there is a pending punishment waiting in the court of law for the act he had committed which is believed as an offence. Right? If he, if he fulfills all these criteria, he is fit to stand trial. Florid delusions, bizarre hallucinations, boisterous behavior, all these things, Nigerian criteria, absolutely it is not a matter of concern to assess the fitness first trial. The expert's testimony is based on four influences, particular symptomatology, diagnosis, Presence of legally relevant impairments, the defendant thought that the killing was justified and the ultimate legal conclusion. The defendant was insane at the time of offense. There are certain issues related to insanity defense. Currently, I think there are a lot of neurological evidences to prove the compulsive behavior as well as lack of control, lack of control of the impulse. So relying on this particular primitive old concept of uh, rationality test, they seem to be outdated. What we really look for is a control determination than the rationality determination. I think we should really be concerned about the evidentiary relevance and relevance ratio is the ideal for evidentiary relevance. You are present, you are probably a person is presented to a psychiatrist with available present uh, mental state examination is asked to give an opinion about the past mental state at the time of committing the crime. And this is being criticized by some people as interpretation of reality rather than identifying objective reality. The difference of past mental status from the assessment of conduct can be explained by relevance ratio. What is relevance ratio? It is a proportion of a particular a relevant symptom in the population of interest to the proportion of the similar symptom the rest of the population. Imagine if X, Y, Z symptoms, for example, delusion of persecution, grandiose delusion and uh, irritability are present in schizophrenic population of the murder history to the extent of 60%. And if these three symptoms are present in the schizophrenic population without the history of murder to the extent of 20%, then the relevance ratio is 60 is to 20, 3 is to 1. If relevance ratio is more than 1, that has to be given proper weightage and one can really believe and conclude about his past mental state. The second problem in assessment of criminal responsibility is matching the dependent variable. If we believe that the delusion of persecution is responsible for culmination and the commission of the particular crime, this is going to tell very little information whether the person had distorted cognition or whether the person harbored any kind of stronger urges at the time of the commission of the crime. An analog research is a fruitful research in this particular criminal responsibility. That research investigates the extent to which people's psychosis fail, compelled or confused about reality in non-criminal situations. An admissibility of the clinical testimony requires four issues. One is the materiality, second is the probative value, and third is helpfulness, and fourth is prejudicial impact. I think it should have, the report should have criteria and validity. Those who receive a particular diagnosis have the same traits. And construct a discriminant validity 
whether a diagnosis avoids significant overlap with other diagnoses. I think in Norwegian legal menu, during the pre-trial process, they formulate opinion as recommended, not recommended, or undecided. And which is, which is not, that particular opinion is not accepted as a valid document in the court of law. They are asked to give opinion at the time of the trial. And the opinion was correlated with the pre-trial observation and it had very significant correlation. This pre-trial observation produced false positive but never false negative results in, with reference to criminal responsibility. I think false positive is better than false negative. How to assess whether the particular crime is committed by a person with an insane mind? Probably the person may not really know, avoid the evidences and he may not go away from the scene of the crime. He may not indulge in a complex activity which may require a very serious cognitive ability or there will not be any multiple accomplices or it may not be pre-planned or pre-meditated. In writing the assessment, Always have a photograph, enter the marks of identification, a brief forensic history, socioeconomic status, details about psychiatric illness, history about substance abuse, criminal record, mental state finding and personality assessment should be there. Gather information from depositions, prison records, medical records, relevant hospital records. And three R's are very important. Retain all the documents till the case is over. Record, keep a structured formula, format so that it can be deciphered by even non-technical person. And reveal all sources of information to get all this information. While interviewing the patient, rapport should be established. And the limitations of confidentiality should be really disclosed to the individual because the psychiatrist is going to offer his opinion and this should be recorded in the observation report. Never write a report without seeing a patient, it is unethical. In case of Daniel McNaughton, the authority, insanity authority, Forbes Winslow, he was asked to give an opinion, unfortunately never examined Daniel McNaughton. He went through the case sheets written by Phillips. A surgeon was working in the Westminster Hospital. This is very unethical. And if there is any history of evidence of mental illness, that information can be disclosed to the treating doctor without disclosing other legal issues. And make a diagnosis as per ICD-10 and DSM-5. If the person is normal, some of the courts, I think, they commented that psychiatrist is not having any kind of expertise with reference to normal behavior. Quite often we write in an observation report, at present he is not exhibiting any overt psychiatric disturbances. Nowhere I think the psychiatrist should say, I mean, mention that the person is completely normal or partially normal. And this is another important criticism about psychiatrist's expertise. First, I think psychiatrists are believed as moral advocates. The qualification, the training and the experience and the expectations of the court are a little bit incongruous with their expectation. The important aspect is the prejudicial versus probative aspects of expertise. The magistrate has got a discretionary power to limit the evidences or the opinion of the psychiatrist, but unfortunately, considering the balance between the prejudicial versus probative aspects, he is asking the psychiatrist to offer an opinion. The R of science is given undue weightage, and unfortunately, I think the psychiatrist is giving certain evidences which are considered to be inadmissible, obfuscatory, and prejudicial, and it was criticized as invading the province of trier of the facts. And the court is expecting certain evidences based on tenets of relevant evidences, but unfortunately, evidences provided by the psychiatrist is based on scientific appraisal. And sometimes the psychiatrist expertise is breaching the confidence of the individual and it is leading to abridgment of constitutional rights because of incineration and self-incrimination and cross-section and assisted counselling. And it should have the evidence 
or the opinion should have a dogged standard should have so it should be like a scientific testimony there should be a theory or a technique it there should be a, a subject to peer review and one should know the potential error rate standards and widespread acceptance and psychiatric qualifications review of literature and uh, probably it summarize the findings give the opinion and lastly about the conclusion it should be well construed opinion need not endorse the view of the lawyer should help the court it should be comprehensible should not be influenced by external factors at the time of appearing the court as a witness the psychiatrist should respect the dignity of other people has got a responsibility to the clients veracity is to be honest and truthful fidelity interested in the client's interest beneficent do good non maleficent do no harm justice be fair and objective he should be i think avoid excessive jewelry and flamboyant colors speak slowly describe in own words avoid jargons dress appropriately when expected talk loudly at times be brief watch the judge whether he is writing whether he is taking any notes i think at that time you should be little slow and do not hesitate to say if you do not know whatever is asked a witness who loses cool or is not truthful usually regrets the experience five more slides a defensive witness may become tensed a disrespect witness may not win the respect of the court an aggressive witness may make mistakes partisan attitude lead to contretemps complicated answers pay way for challenge vague answers lead to impression of evasiveness cross examination you should be very careful probably the experts expertise may be tested you have to be little more patient and your method of information collection may be challenged you must be in a position to answer this very difficult to answer in a sr no pattern sometimes you need to really you know explain in a very complex way with the permission of the judge i think you can do that when other alternative explanation is given by the contesting party the psychiatrist should be in a position to accept it imagine there is a secondary depression due to psychological event and the other party presents another explanation like marital disorder which is responsible for the secondary depression that should be accepted and even during pre trial observations psychiatrist should prepare for this standardized scales should be i mean used but their limitation should be known and hurrying the witness probably what i feel now <laughs> probably sometimes you no know, you have to be little more patient and these are all the medical certificates form for certificate of unfitness application for reception order treatment certificate and form of certificate recommended for leave or extension commutation of leave fitness and probably futuristic issues is the last leg i think mark court should be there elaboration of training expert roles outside the courtroom technological approaches should be there ethical issues should be adhered and we should really you know update our uh, scientific knowledge in future whatever opinion we are going to give ultimately the magistrates opinion is going to be final sometimes we may be asked to give opinion about the past mental state we should rely on evidentiary relevance with reference to criminal responsibility thank you very much or is a welcome thank you dr ashokan before i hand over the mic to my co chairperson dr ashok reddy i would like to mention a few points especially for the youngsters see whenever in a court of law when we mean mental illness but still the court says insanity only whatever your mental health act mental health care act whatever you talk they talk only about the indian lunacy act name they say whether the person is sane or insane who is considered to be insane as per the law nothing you are comprehensive to expect definition or anything is considered schizophrenia paranoid subtype heavy feeling all this will not count if a person does not know what he is doing is right or wrong he is insane finish if he is not knowing what he is doing is right or wrong he is insane and whenever the court language insanity means almost all the time except a few occasions insanity means it is only severe mental illnesses as per the who's 
general practitioners or general public classification, the mental disorders are classified into two, SMI and CMD, severe mental illness and common mental disorders. The court considered mental illness only the severe mental illness, not even generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder or phobic disorder, all these things, nothing. Because sometimes with you must be given propranol 20 milligram BD and clonazip 0.5 milligram with the prescription, he will go and give it to the uh, advocate. You have know, so got uh, evidence. But you can say it's a very common problem. Anybody can get anxiety like that. It is not uh, to be considered as a mental illness or insanity. So that will not hold good. And the other important thing, what I would like to say, when very often in the court of law, the judges or any judicial officer will give good respect and dignity to the doctors, any doctor. If you go with the court, avoid court, even if you stand in the corner or sit in a corner, first he will ask his assistant, first to finish the doctor's opinion. Yeah, there may be 25 cases, but he will ask first to finish the doctor and let him go and do his work. So that respect is still there in the court of law, many courts. And sometimes the court matter will be very funny also. Recently I had been to Paramakudi court. I, ex I saw a person, lady, seven years back, and I, my diagnosis with the, I had my uh, case file as minimal cognitive impairment. I saw the case after seven years, and there is a, she is a widow with no issues. So there is a problem between the husband's side and her side. And I explained, I was say seven years back I saw, now I will need some time to re-examine her, then only I can give my opinion. The court allowed. I examined her for, for 25 minutes. Then I come to know that she is now a full-blown dementia case. Then I explained dementia case to the court and except some higher courts, majority of the courts which we are going in interior of our states, they need our Tamil version of statement. Because the Seno will write only in Tamil. If you say, I don't know Tamil, they will write English and they will have their own translation, which will not be right. After giving a five minutes talk about dementia to the uh, judicial officer in Tamil, finally the judicial officer says, see, there are 45 advocates were there. What I say is correct. This lady is suffering from mental retardation. <laughs> sir, 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 one minute. I never use that word. He is suffering from a severe mental illness because of the damage of the brain cells. It is called a dementia. In Tamil, we can say, Manathiran Malungunoi. Oh, that is different. Yes, sir, very much different. Oh, then right. So this type of jokes and all will be there. If you do not give proper Tamil words, it will be recorded in a different way also. So each should be according to your state of language. You should be you should be familiar with your uh, terminology equivalent to English words also. That is very important. And other important thing, as I already uh, mildly pointed out by Dr. Ashokan, some of the uh, defensive lawyers, they will question us too much. They want to trap you. They will say, no, you tell only yes or no. Some questions we can say. Some questions say, no, I cannot say yes or no to this question. Uh, sir, I would like to explain more in this case. Many times the judicial officer says, yes, sir, doctor, you go ahead with some explanation. So the, 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 the advocates may corner you to say yes or no. Not necessary, we do not always obey them. And like that, with that small prescription or somebody, the, along with the petitioner, the advocate will come to your consulting room. See, this patient is treated by you. I want a certificate regarding this thing. You can boldly deny, no, I will not give anything to you. I cannot discuss. If she is my patient or he is my patient, I cannot discuss with you. If anything comes from the court, I will respond to the court. That way you can vary. But at the same time, if it is going to be a 
police investigating case, you have to cooperate with the inspecting authority or investigating authority. You have to co cooperate. And whatever you said, you have to read again and write and sig signature. Because uh, when morning I am coming here, there is a call from CBID from Coimbatore. Some of these Coimbatore doctors may be familiar with the cases recently. A bipolar disorder doctor. The CBID sitting in Chennai, we want to talk to you for half an hour today regarding your patient. Because so many things happen for that lady. It's a criminal case, so many cases, abduction case, so many things. So, in that case, if they have an order, you can tell the fact, whichever possible, but you have to verify it and sign it. Yes, I have told this thing. But the records you have to give only to the court. And sometimes, the court also, you can, not, you can say, I have seen this case seven years back, eight years back. You can say, I can see again and tell only. Because, as supposed by the MCI, you can retain your case sheet only for three years. More than that, not necessary at all. If it is going to be already a criminal related cases or research cases, that case sheet should be maintained for minimum five years. So, you 15 years back, you saw a case and now tell, you have to say, I have to re-examine. Again, I have to produce a certificate. Definitely not. I need not keep the certificate. So this is the thing. Sometimes you need not worry about it. I don't know a case sheet. But better hereafter means even in a small paper, a routine for one page enough to write your important findings and complaints and other things. If it is not documented, it is not done. That is a good clinical practice. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Ashok Reddy. Dr. Ashokan, with absolute clarity, has given us all the knowledge which is required to us to stand in the court as expert witness. It is very clear. Still many doubts will be there. Probably we can raise the doubts. And he has very covered up the framework under which we are supposed to work for the presentation in the court. And he has also told what to do and what not to do. And the attitude of us in the court, this is all the broad framework under which he has presented today. One important aspect I want to mention is about the ID marks, identification marks in the case sheets is very essential to be again read in the court. Otherwise, a lot of problems will be there in the mentally ill patients. I'll just share my experience. Once I went to one of the courts, the patient I saw him about four years back when he was brought to the court, he got to the hospital in a totally shabbily dressed, grown beard, totally insane person. But when the patient was, the same patient was in the court, he was waiting at the gate of the court in a very neat dress, well shaved, very difficult to recognize them. I thought he is his relative. But once I went inside the court, now judge will ask you to identify. It's very difficult to identify them. So we are supposed to go through the case sheet, see the identification marks which are mentioned already, check on the patient and then say yes, this is a person. Otherwise, we will be at fault. So always try to enter the ID marks in the case sheets while examining the hospitals itself. That's the first thing to be done. Then testamentary capacity, usually they ask us, this person was not having the capacity in the past. I don't know how to say, I want the answer from a presenter. Like they will say, they will bring the will and they claim that at that time his testamentary capacity was false, so it's not valid. Family members too try to get this and they want us. It's very difficult for us to say whether at that time he was having capacity or not. Another thing is about more than two years duration. How do we say it was more than two years duration? These are few doubts what I want to ask the presenter to present. Actually, it is very difficult to really know, comment about the past mental state with available present uh, mental state examination. That's why we are bringing a new concept called relevance ratio. 
relevant to the issue probably you know we have to really you know collect all the criminal cases and do the research and identify some of the variables which are really responsible for commission or culmination of the particular crime identify the factor and probably in an analog research which may investigate whether this particular variable has compelled the individual to go for a cognitive distortion or to harbor some uh, irresistible impulses and probably from that i think there is a proposal to generate a particular scale and if these things are present probably there is a possibility and again we have to go and rely on our scientific appraisal so when i say scientific appraisal it is a corroborative evidence no court is accepting the corroborative evidence they want direct evidences i think cases winning a case and losing a case it's based on evidences but unfortunately i think our psychiatrists opinion and is though it is based on scientific appraisal and uh, we have solid evidence with our scientific knowledge but that is that cannot be uttered as a direct evidence uh, the court believes in direct evidences again it is coming to the absolutely it is the it is to the purview of the magistrate who is going to conclude about the case even if you say that the person had uh, probably no adequate capacity mental capacity at the time of uh, compiling the will it is ultimately it is up to the discretion of the magistrate to weigh and uh, this is because there are a lot of criticism there are in fact very very uh, difficult to accept so most of the patients that are admitted in a institute of mental health when i examine i think most patients they pre planned and they were knowing that they were committing an offense in criminal ward in uh, most of the patients and understandability was not there understandability was there whenever i think a case is submitted to the court of law with the tag of mental illness immediately anupavana aimachuk that was a state of affairs and they are not really you know applying any standard they are not really you know applying the uh, legal insanity when there is a the diagnosis of insanity mental illness they don't even look at probably even now the situation is just the same or not we have to go further and further and there should be some discussion there should be amendment with reference to legal provisions like insanity to the person and we were saying sir so means my chronic mental illness severe mental illness and even i think our mental health care act i think the mental illness is mental illness with the dangerousness i think this is going to generate and how to predict dangerousness and not able to look after himself and not able to really you know provide safety and security other people yes the admission procedure is going to be different once a person who got admitted on that ground i think is there any possibility of becoming normal these are all the issues nothing is permanent here in a philosophical way even our mental illness at times probably you may not have capacity and at times you may have adequate capacity so i think we have to give uh, all the possible explanation and uh, maybe we can't be very directly you know i mean emphatically we can come out about the past mental state psychiatrist in the western legal milieu they are criticized as people distorting the reality rather than identifying objective reality probably the day may come here also but our legal system are still primitive i think we still use the word lunatic in uh, legal milieu we still use the word insanity and there should be some kind of uh, Uh, understanding in the revision of criminal uh, yeah, laws related to psychiatry and we should also update frequent meetings uh, and the liaison with the yeah. other uh, legal professional should be there and with reference to two years this is also another uh, gray area at the time of petition for seeking divorce i think the person should prove that the mental illness was there at the time of marriage and it is continuous dangerous and this dangerous concept i think emotionally schizophrenia is not previously it was a valid ground for divorce but it was justice ansari who commented on one particular aspect i think schizophrenia need not be a valid ground but unless it produces emotional damage 
An emotional damage is highly individualistic. It is not collectively no, you can apply the yardstick emotional damage. What is pain to you and you not be pain to me. I may be tolerating or I may be, you know, I mean, different concept. Marriage is tolerated in compatibility in spite of all this importance or probably, you know, people may adjust, people may tolerate. Importance is legally valid ground if it is not producing distress and if it is not producing any kind of an emotional damage. If they raise this emotional aspect, I think invariably the female is going to win. And with reference to importance, this is also the another area. I am not satisfied. Yes, that is enough to get divorced. Uh, one more question. Yeah, many magistrates are uh, not able to understand what a delusion or hallucination is. About a uh, few years ago, I went to Krishnagiri court where a BPAD patient had uh, murdered uh, his cousin, uh, Pangali, I mean. And the magistrate, uh, when I told him, he has done out of suspicion. And uh, what is suspicion? He asked, delusion, technically I told. What is this delusion? What is this nonsense? Hallucination. He had a uh, hallucination telling, Konude, uh, Konude, Pangali, Konude. So he was not able to understand that. He was telling, Did get money from uh, anybody and uh, gave the certificate that he is uh, mentally ill, he was asking. So how to convince this uh, judiciary uh, about delusion and hallucination? As you rightly told, they should be given an awareness program about this uh, technological terms of delusion and hallucination. Even in several years, we have been going to the court, more than 40 years, we are going to the court. Still we are uh, unable to convince them about delusion No, we should never talk in terms of delusion No, 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 I am not telling. Even when they asked about the water. technical term, I told about delusion out of mental illness, out of hearing voices. It was, what do you hear voices? Are you imagining? Are you mentally ill or he is mentally ill was asking me? Then I had to sue a defamation suit against him in Kishnagiri court. And it was compromised later, he apologized to me. That is a different question. But it still we have to go a long way in making them comprehend the technical terms and the implications of epileptic furor and uh, partial complex seizure. They don't know anything about it at all. The next is, uh, what is the role of reception order and detention order as on today? Because um, as you know, we are all out of service for more than seven years. Change. Uh, what is the role of reception order and uh, detention order uh, in the government? Sir, sir, detention order is the order given by a prison official. I think detention was used in Indian Lunacy Act 1912 which was compiled by the British period and in Mental Health Act was compiled by Indian Psychiatric Society and Mental Health Care Act I think non-psychiatrists our uh, friendly enemies I think they compiled it and we are going to face the music. Reception order I think is an order given by the court and it is valid for 30 days. Beyond 30 days we need not entertain reception order. In the reception order they should mention alleged mental illness. We Without, I think, uh, getting any confirmation, no, no, without getting the confirmation or without contacting the medical person, I think the person, the magistrate can issue a reception order to be on the safer side. They invariably send the individual for some kind of an opinion or to get some uh, OP ticket as an evidence. Then they'll probably, you know, section 23 class 2, I think they were using that reception order. Detention order currently, I think when a person admitted in a Trichy uh, prison for any other uh, offence as a normal prisoner at the time of going for imprisonment, I think he is developing mental illness. The uh, superintendent of the Trichy jail has got adequate power and in his order, that is known as detention order. Sir, detention order was the term used in Indian Lunacy Act, but the section 30, cla I mean, uh, 30 of class 3 of 1900 in Prisoners Act, even when they transfer from prison to psychiatric hospital IMH, they use the word detention order. Already is under detention. So this is a kind of a transfer. But detention, you certainly know it's imprisonment. Reception order, probably it is not that. The person may be under trial, person may be examined, he has to be presented before uh, thing. Before, for the previous question, our past president, I think one that you know, passed a comment, there are two kinds of psychiatrists and two kinds of legal people. The first group, the psychiatrists, they know more law than psychiatry. And the other person, the law people, they know more psychiatry than. The second group, probably they don't know anything. 
Unfortunately, in most of the court, I think probably you know, we face these people who question the definition of delusion. And probably you know, we may go for war while they are writing about themselves. But is the same uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But the detention order is. Two or three previously, Indian Rules Act 1912, according to Indian National Rules Act 1987, using Form 7. Yes, sir. But. Uh, we, are, we have to change our reception order. I think mental, mental, uh, mental Ranchi, they have formulated one reception order, CAP Ranchi. I was showing in my slides. But as per Mental Health Care Act, I think Nambi also in his forensic book, I think he had given the model of various certificates. But again, we have to really work and uh, include our uh, ID marks. I think more than ID marks, these days, I think whenever a patient is seeking help, either in private practice or in government hospital or in private hospital, they invariably give the pseudo name, family name, or some other name. So it's better to get the mobile number. Even if they give PP number, 90% we may be right. Try to get the mobile number of the patient. It's almost like ID mark or Aadhaar card. They will never, uh, probably, know. they will invariably give the correct number. They may change. Sir, in a week, I'm going to call Kumar. I'm going to call Kumar. Where are you? Something like that. I'm going to call Kalyana Ayadu. I'm going to call Kumar. I'm going to call Kumar. I'm going to call Kumar. I had that kind of experience. But they will not confuse us with mobile numbers. Please get mobile number. And if you are a follower of Modi, get Aadhaar number also. Uh, just to Excuse answer Dr. Kumar's question, in your giving expert opinion or in your certificate, do not use technical jargon at all. Take no technical jargon. You cannot expect the judge to know what is delusion. Even our perceiver is sometimes confusing. So do not bother about it. No technical jargon. Very simple, understandable language by a lay person. And to conclude this session, I want sir, to quote just one, yes. one, one, one question, sir. Uh, so I, want, I, I think first uh, he raised to his thing. Yes, Dr. Vengadeshan, then Ramanajam. Okay. Uh, both uh, Professor Reddy's uh, uh, question about the duration. In a diverse suit, sometimes it is very easy. The aspirin producers have continuous prescriptions for two years. You will be having it, you will be taking the aspirin uh, wife to the doctor or something like that. In that case, no, no, there, is, there are two issues, sir. Well, I, I will just complete and then you can say About the more than uh, dangerousness in the marital relationship, what the law insists is the incurability of illness. So sometimes it is easy to establish the duration by the number of prescriptions, the continuing prescriptions and other things to some extent we can prove the duration of the illness and the incurability of the illness depends on the doctor who is a neutral government doctor who examines and gives the expert testimony when the judge asks they can answer the question and regarding the testamentary capacity at the time of the execution of the will. It is generally we have to presume if the will is registered in front of a huge audience and the two in front of a magistrate and do witness naturally we have to take it as a genuine without any insanity. But here again, sometimes circumstantial evidence you have to take it. Uh, you may be aware of the Birla case in this context. You know, um, GD Birla has four issues. One of them is uh, MP Birla, Madhya Prasad Birla, and his wife is Prime Vada Birla. These two couples, they have no property more than 10,000 crores. And both of them, they executed a mutual will. <coughs> Where is mutual, it means both of them have decided, after the demise, the whole property should go to Birla Trust. Now what happens? MP Birla dies. This widow, that is uh, Payamvada Birla, has now more than 12,000 crore rupees. And all of a sudden, his chartered accountant, that is Loda, he, she bequeathed a will testifying all the property should go it. This fellow is an outsider. Birla executes a will, all the property. Now that the dispute is going on in the Calcutta High Court, one of the evidence that is thrown on the court is this lady was treated for memory loss. So that gives a clue whether this lady has taken a real decision at the time of accident. So this type of it, uh, circumstantial evidence, to some extent, will raise a doubt about the genuineness of the will. Thank you. Ah. Sir, uh, a fortnight ago I have received a summons from Sivaganga court. So this patient is from a remote village. I treated him. This patient was treated by me as a case of bipolar mood disorder some 11 years ago. 
and uh, luckily I was having the documentary evidence that he, wa he was given about eight ECTs and all. So what happened, uh, this fellow when he was ill, uh, it's a small village, he has gone to a nearby house and he raped a young girl. So all these people in the village forcibly uh, married that girl to him. And after living, uh, uh, he was not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, living with her properly, but after 11 years, he has filed a court saying that I was insane at the time, 11 years ago, I have taken a treatment from a doctor, so uh, the court should make the marriage null and void. So I was called, uh, luckily, <coughs> the, uh, uh, as always, the lawyers were on strike, so probably the case will be posted uh, next week or so. No, I, I'll, I'll answer. I face a similar situation. There are two issues involved. One is the nullity of the marriage, whether the marriage is valid at the time of marriage. That is the issue. At the time of marriage, mental illness should be there. Then, when a person is presenting a petition, to go over to go against the nullity of the, the, that particular concept, the illness should be there for two years continuously. Maybe so, I am wrong. I have told you for divorce. I am not. Yeah, no, no. no getting divorce is can't getting divorce is different. That is all. This is. I think at the time of marriage. There are two aspects. It's not as you rightly say. Yes. Only that marriage should, the marriage illness should be there. Contract is valid or not? Other thing is whether it's and needs and he must be in a position to really comprehend, give the concern for marital knots. So, I think probably the family photo should be there, marriage should be there, relatives should be there, there is an evidence to definitely will be available. On that ground, in spite of a bipolar, I think probably the marriage is acceptable. So, it is valid. But to claim divorce, again, that is a different issue. You have mental illness, incurable, in spite of treatment, I think dangerous is there. And is no more, I think, really, no, I'm not very comfortable with the other partner. That's a different issue. But in, you can have mental illness, but that should interfere with your comprehension. That, is in, that should interfere with your knowing, something like that. And probably, you know, you would have really, you know, tied the knot in front of all the people. As for a photograph, about the marriage in a very innocent way, then submit it and tell that its marriage is valid. And probably you let him claim divorce of another party. Probably you can escape. Absolutely. You know, we, we need not tell about it. I think at that time of marriage, probably in spite of having a bipolar disorder, he had obliged the commitments and the responsibilities on the day of marriage. Probably the comprehension may be good and he was following all the instructions right from the IR to Mamiyar, Mamanar, Ella Sadangum Manirpa. That's why it's not acceptable. Uh, Thank you very much sir, for, uh, because already as a warning signal from the organizers, twice they gave the warning signal. So with this, uh, we conclude this session. Very uh, interactive sessions and very useful session. We thank the speaker and the very patiently listening audience also. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.